Lord, we thank you for the day in front of us. We thank you that it's so beautiful outside. We thank you for excuses to have some good, clean fun, be a little bit silly, and enjoy each other's company. Um, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Oh, 
and you've been forgiven by God for a great deal, then songs like that, I imagine, resonate deeply with your heart as they do with mine. Um, go ahead and be seated. Um, I'm going to ask all of you for a favor. Appreciate that. Thank you very much for helping us out with that. All right. Uh, and for our offertory, we have some special music. Please pray with me over our offering. Lord, we thank you very much for all your blessings and for a chance to give back a little bit of what you've given us uh, to serve your ministry here on earth. Please help us as a church to be wise with these gifts. In Jesus' name, amen. This song, um, this song talks about how life is so precious and if you don't take care of it, it, it can uh, wither. But it also talks about how our eternal life in God will never die, will never wither, will, will always be fresh. So that's what we're talking about. If you don't know Spanish, those who you know Spanish are going to know the words and really enjoy the words to this song. It's a nice Christian mariachi too. We're going to try to sing this song and a pastor is going to try it in Spanish and uh, American style. So yeah, that's what it is. So we didn't practice that much, but I know we do it for Lord. So, and I, I, I speak my English and my Mexican style, so that's it. Sale y ma 
mañana ya no está. Así es el hombre en esta vida, porque sus That's such a nice applause. Maybe we should sing mariachi in our church all the time. <laughs> Apparently, they really like it, okay? <laughs> okay, huh? <laughs> well, I don't think... Tommy, you're f sopped and wet, and so is Rat? What happened to you? Rat and I were... We're cowboys. You're being cowboys. Well, how'd you get wet? Did you get caught in a rainstorm? Yeah. Along the canal. And this snake jumped out. And the horse got scared and dumped us in the canal. Whoa, so you just got sopping wet. and throwing that rope to us, you'd be looking at one Tommy and one rat laying down face in the canal. Wow. Yeah, I think God had that guy come right by just when we needed him and throw us a rope. I tell you, I'm really thankful to God. You know, being a cowboy, it's not like on the movies, okay? It's really hard work. And it's dangerous, too. And you got to trust God to be a cowboy because you never know when a storm's going to come up or a rattlesnake or maybe Indians or any kind of danger. And it's not like the movies. Well, that's just, you know, I think that's like our Christian life. You know, our Christian life's not like the movies either because sometimes in our Christian life, it's like riding on the cattle trail. It's really hard sometimes. The sun baking down or storms come up in our life, things that we didn't expect. There might be even a few rattlesnakes along the way. Yeah. Well, I learned something. You know what I learned? What did you learn? I learned that 
it's a lot easy, a lot easier watching cowboys than it is being them. Well, that's probably true in being a Christian. It's a lot easier watching cowboys and saying, hey, you're doing it wrong, than it is actually being a cowboy, isn't it? Yeah, a Christian. Thanks. Yeah, it's a lot easier being a, just watching a Christian and criticizing being a Christian than it is to actually live the Christian life. And that's the same way it is being a cowboy. It's harder to be a cowboy than just to watch them. But you know what, kids? You got something to say to the kids? Yeah. Hey, kids, no matter how it is, no matter how hard it is to be a Christian, you work at it, you be a Christian. Because it's worth it at the end of the trail. Okay? Thanks for coming up. Now you can go to kids' church. Hey, remember, we got days and lots of fun after church. But don't forget to eat your chili before you go to the Western Days Fun, okay? All right. Thank you, kids. Jean says, my wife Jean says, do you have time to change after you do that thing? Because she says, I think it might be distracting. So uh, don't look at me, okay? I know, you're, I know normally I don't dress up and I'm not much to look at. But boy, I'll tell you, today I got the duds on. And so uh, pay attention to the sermon. Don't look at me, okay, today. I don't really have time to change out of this before we preach today. Um... This suit was made, by the way, this suit was made for me, oh, months and months ago. We've been planning doing something on Western Days for months and months. And it was made for me by Miguel. Stand up, Miguel. He's, he sewed it for me. And he also made his, I think, his suit and also his son Mike's suit. And they're like three to $600, but if you buy the material and put on the work, they're like about $100. So uh, he'll be taking orders after the church service. <laughs> Probably not worth it. It takes hours and hours to make one of these, doesn't it? But uh, I hope to get more use out of it. He, they were in the, in the room when we were changing, they were calling me, what were you calling me? The, what's the name for Spanish? The white mariachi? The, what was it? The white? Mariachi what? Cuero? You can see how hard it is for me to learn this music. <laughs> I can't even get the word white in Spanish, you know, but I work at it. Well, let me tell you, today's lessons from the trail. I found out about riding a horse when I was about either six or seven years old. Now, I grew up in North Dakota, and I've got cousins who are actually Indians, okay? And so we went out to visit our Indian cousins, and, and I thought, boy, this is going to be great. And they had horses, and uh, they said, hey, you want to sit on this horse? And I think I was either six or seven years old, and I'd seen movies where cowboys would, you know, be on the horse and stuff. And I said, yeah, I want to sit on the horse. So my cousin, who was, a, a, she was probably maybe 17 or 18, she was a gal, she lifted me up and put me on the horse. And I did like I've seen in the movies. I held all the way back on the rein, and I went like that, and I went, and I kicked the horse with both things, and I went, yeah! <laughs> and the horse took out at, as fast as it could, and I've never been on a horse before, and I'm going, <laughs> I'm, I'm going, God help me, God help me. <laughs> and I'm heading for some farm machinery, and my dad's there too. My dad is freaking out, okay? <laughs> But my cousin, who's already on the horse, thought fast, and she took off galloping uh, uh, after me. And before we were probably from maybe 50 feet from the machinery, and she comes alongside and she says, "Hold up on the rein! Hold up on the rein! Hold up on the rein!" And she showed me, you know, she said, "Just grab it right here." So I grabbed up on the rein. She said, "Now pull back!" I pulled back. And you know what? That horse came to a stop. <laughs> so that was my first experience riding a horse. And my dad, I, my dad would never let us ride horses, okay? And I always thought it, cause it was because he didn't like horses. I found out three weeks ago when my brothers and sisters and I, my dad and mom are both gone, my brothers and sisters and I are emailing each other and sending uh, uh, memories of our parents, 
I, I guess that you do that when you get old or something. I don't know. But <laughs> we're sending memories of our parents back by email. And my brother said, did you know why my, our dad, even though we lived on a farm and we had horses, we would never ride horses. We took care of horses for other people. He said, do you know why, my, why our dad would not let, you ri let us ride horses? It's because when he was young, he was forced to break horses to make money. I always thought it was that my dad didn't know how to ride a horse, you know. But he was forced to break them, and it, he just did not like, like it. It just sou soured him on riding horses. Well, you know, I want to talk a little bit about the cattle drives today. The cattle drives were from 1866 to 1886. There were not too many railroads back then, so they had to get the cattle from ranges, a lot of times in Texas, up to Kansas, to the railheads. And they estimate, uh, historians estimate there were 20 million cattle who were moved along the trail from Texas to Kansas and other railheads, shipped to Chicago and then on to the east where the markets for beef were and the population centers were. They would typically ride about 15 miles a day or drive the cattle 15 miles a day and they would take a rest in the middle of the day for the cattle to eat and also at the end of the day uh, and, and through the night. They could not drive the cattle too hard because if they did, they'd lose too much weight and, they'd lo and of course lays, they would lose money because they'd get paid by the pound. Now, movie westerns have made the cowboys known all over the world. But the cattle drives were really not like the western movies. It was two or three months out in the open, on the trail, in some of the most violent weather on this planet. And you know, in many ways, our Christian journey is kind of like a cattle drive. And there's some lessons that we learn along the trail. I want to talk about some of those lessons we learn along the trail. Number one lesson in our Christian life, everyone starts out as a tenderfoot or a greenhorn. And you're not toughened to the trail. This world is a difficult place to live. 2 Corinthians 5.17 talks about when you're a greenhorn to this Christian life, when you accept Christ. It says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. We all start out brand new. As a baby, we all start out spiritually as babes in Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul says, Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You're still worldly. For since there are jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? You know, sometimes, as we've become transformed by Jesus Christ and the power of God, we forget that one time we were a tenderfoot a greenhorn. We forget. We take, it, uh, we take for granted the lessons that we've kind of learned <coughs> along the way. And I think one of the most wonderful ways to refresh our Christian faith, if you've been on the trail for many years in particular, is to come alongside a tenderfoot or a greenhorn and walk them through how it is to live this Christian life. Walk, them, walk along with them on the trail. All of a sudden, the things that you learned years ago become fresh in you. And I think God has, has designed the church that way. There are some who are new in their faith, and there are others who are just starting out. And we need, to come, we need the, the tenderfoots, the greenhorns, they need those experienced trail hands to come alongside them, get to know them, and walk on the trail with them a little bit. You don't have to know everything to teach them. You know more than what you think you do. And as, as you walk along the trail, things will come up in life that you've experienced or someone else has experienced, and you can be that word of encouragement to them. So I want to encourage everyone here to remember there was a time when you were a tenderfoot, a greenhorn. Think back. And what are you going to do to help a tenderfoot, a greenhorn, maybe even someone who doesn't even know if they want to be on the trail? What are you going to do? You find someone and you come alongside them and you help them. Remember, we were all tenderfoots. We are all greenhorns at one point in time. 
Lesson number two I have today. You have to count your cattle and round up the strays before nightfall. How many of you have had parents, our parents that, uh, that our parents whose child was out at night and you didn't know where they were? Raise your hand. Almost every parent experiences that, don't you? What does that feel like? It doesn't feel very good, does it? You got to round up your strays. You want to know where they are before nightfall because there's dangers out there on the trail, especially away from the herd. You know, now, people can wander astray too. It's not just little calves that wander. Sometimes cows and even bulls will sometimes wander away from the herd. And they're not going to find their way back unless one of the cowboys goes out and gets them. You might even need to occasionally rope them and bring them in. Or if it's a little calf, you might put them on top of your shoulders. Jesus didn't uh, farm with cattle, but he did raise sheep, and there's a lot of similarities. In Luke chapter 15, 3 through 6, Jesus told them this parable. He says, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. Jesus didn't live in cattle country, but the same principles apply to sheep. You know, in a herd, there's always a few strays. Those who are wandering just a little farther, they think the grass is maybe a little greener on the other side. They like to explore, and they get off, and they get lost. And it's not a problem until nightfall when the animals come out and they're in danger. You know, there are people that say, well, I can be a cow without the herd. I'll just eat all by myself. Doesn't work very well. Pretty dangerous to be a cow without the herd. How can the cow find food and water and defend themselves against predators? You got to round up your cattle before nightfall. Sometimes you just have to go out and rope them and bring them back in. And you know, it doesn't matter how good of a cowboy you are, how great, the, how much the, the cattle love the cow hands, you're still going to have a few strays. You may do a great job as a parent raising your family. You might be a great Sunday school teacher or a youth leader, but you're still going to have some strays. And you need to go out and you need to round them up and bring them in before nightfall or before something happens. Another lesson on the trail, you're going to need food and water along the trail. Now the cowboys have food and water with them at all times. It's called the chuck wagon. And cowboys typically would eat beans mixed with meat. A lot of times it was dried meat and they would cook it and boil it and, along with the beans. And they almost always had either some kind of a cracker or a biscuit to go with that. Which, you know, sounds pretty good. That's kind of what we're going to be eating today. But you probably wouldn't want it every day, would you? But that's kind of what the cowboys ate every day. And I suppose if there were some Mexican cowboys, they might have even cooked up a few cactuses once in a while. Or maybe they would find some berries along the way and that would be a treat also. Or some other kinds of food. Occasionally they might shoot a, a, a deer or some food and they'd have some fresh meat. But they kind of had to scrounge along the way and find whatever food they could. But they always had to make sure they took a break for lunch every day because you can't be a cowboy, you can't work that hard without getting some food. And of course they always needed water because the trail was hot. And they also needed to rest every night along with the cattle. You know, the Lord has created a day of rest for us called the Sabbath. And He's given us food and water. Our food is the Word of God and our water is the Spirit of God who's always there able to quench our thirst. I like the Psalm of David because I think it brings out the fact that, that we need that food and water, but that God will provide it. Psalm of David 23, The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. 
He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I, they had rods and staff. The cowboys had six guns. That was a comfort. They comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Praise God. He's our shepherd. He guides us along this path of life. Another lesson from the trail. Did you know that there are rattlesnakes along the trail? They can kill a, a cow. They can even kill a cowboy. You have to watch out for them and shoot them. You have to learn their habits. Where do they like to hide? And you keep a sharp lookout for them and you shoot them while they're still outside of striking range. How many people here like snakes? Several. Our daughter-in-law, uh, Lindsay Hoyer, is one of those that likes snakes. They would keep snakes. But most people don't like snakes, and I suppose that's the reason why in the Bible, when it refers to serpents and snakes, it's always negative. We, of course, remember that first uh, snake who tempted Adam and Eve with evil and the entrance of evil into our world. But through the Bible, it talks about snakes. And a lot of times when it refers to a snake, it's talking about Satan, the devil, the evil one. You know, all people are different, and I think we have different rattlesnakes. Rattlesnakes hide in different places for different people. You know that even Jesus was tempted by Satan? In fact, Satan, that serpent, quoted scripture to Jesus. When he was entering the wilderness, before he was entering his public ministry and he was being tested in the wilderness, the devil came to him and he quoted Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12. He said to Jesus, Show your power. Show off. Show off that you're really the Son of God. And he said, isn't it written? For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways that they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. So tempt God. Throw yourself off and see what God does and prove that you are the son of God. Well, he quoted part of the psalm and it's a beautiful psalm. And there's, a, there's part of the psalm that he conveniently left out. And it's the part of the psalm that has the condition for God's care and shelter in our life. Read verse 9. It says, If you say the Lord is my refuge. And then also it implies it in the next one. And if you make the most high your dwelling no harm will overtake you. If you're going to walk out among the rattlesnakes, you're going to get bit. You're not going to be protected. If you tempt God and you put yourself in a place where you are tempted by evil, you are going to get bit. The scripture says, if you say the Lord is my refuge and you make the most high your dwelling, then no harm will will overtake you. No da disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra and you will trample the great lion and the serpent. Well, that's a prophecy about Jesus, but it's also a promise to God's people. And when we look at Jesus' life, well, he was crucified on the cross, and Satan's henchmen did it. But in the, on the cross, he trampled the head of that serpent because it's 
through the nails in his feet and the nails in his hands that we are given salvation and eternal life. You know, that promise is not that your life is going to be easier, easy. When you live under the shelter of the Most High, you live under His eternal blessing. But that does not mean that you're not going to experience some difficult times in this life. You may even be doing God's will and you may experience persecution and difficulty. But the part, the, your soul, your spirit, you will be protected by God. The part that is eternal. It's like that song we sang. This life is so precious it can wither. And you need to treat it preciously. But there's only one thing that will not wither. And that's the eternal life that we have in Christ. Amen. So no matter what happens in your life, live under the shelter of the Most High and you will be saved. Another lesson from the trail. You know, it is a long journey. I know if you're older, you feel like time flies, right? But when, if you were to sit down and, and think about all the trials you've been through on the trail, it's a long journey. You know, it's, it's kind of interesting because when you're young, you look at older people and they have it all, they, they have it so together, okay? They're happy, they seem to deal with change and things in life. And you think, oh, and especially if they're an old saint, you know, someone who's been growing and being transformed by God for years and years and years. You think, wow, they must always live this great life. <laughs> but then when you get to know someone who's been around and been on the trail, and if you say, well, what have you experienced on the trail of life? And you will be amazed at what people have been through. You know, you might look at Shelley and say, Wow, you know, she seems to have it together pretty well. She's happy and joyful. Shelly, you must have lived a great life. You, you know, you probably didn't experience too many trials. No, well, I've only been through cancer, what, twice or more? Yeah. You know, and been told you don't have time to live. And the same is true of many of you. I've gotten, over the last few years, I've gotten to know some of your stories. It's a long journey, and there are storms along the trail. I grew up in the Midwest. I grew up first in North Dakota, and in North Dakota, I learned what snowstorms were. There was a snowstorm in, I think it was 1969. Now I'm talking like an old person. <laughs> Back in 1969. <laughs> There was, and I'm not exaggerating, there was a storm, a snowstorm, and I was a kid. I don't know how old I was. I'm not going to try to figure that out. Well, let's see, 56 to 69. <laughs> 13, I was 13 years old. Right before we left North Dakota and moved to Kansas, we had a big picture window, and it was really cool because we lived on top of a hill, and we, could, and we overlooked the Missouri River. Beautiful, beautiful uh, picture. We would eat dinner there and look at the Missouri River as it kind of, you know, rolled away. We were on top of the hill. And uh, outside of the picture window, there was a porch, kind of like what you have in California here, except a lot smaller. And that porch had a post that was from me to that microphone stand that's in the piano right there. Okay? We had a snowstorm, I think it was in May. Can you believe it? Snowstorm in May? That's North Dakota. That's when the real blizzards come. We had a snowstorm. I did not, could not, and the, there was nothing wrong with the window. It wasn't fogged up. I could not see that post for three days. And my dad tied a rope out to the chickens so that he could get out there and, uh, and get out to the chickens and feed them and water them. I went out one time with him. Thought it was pretty cool. But then after the snowstorm was over, <laughs> There was a drift on top of our house in our garage. I could walk on top of our house, and we built tunnels. And we had 10 days off of school. They, I mean, North Dakota is prepared for bad weather. I mean, they got these huge machines. But it took them 10 days to get, us, to get, every, to get the roads cleared because the roads were you know, this high with snow blizzard, blizzarded up. It was so cool. We had so much fun. <laughs> then when we moved to Kansas, I found out what a rainstorm was. 
I was working one day on a Saturday trying to make, get my way through college and I saw a rainstorm coming up and as the rainstorm came up there literally was a wall of water and as soon as that wall of water came you couldn't see anything in back of it. And uh, I closed the doors on the, the place that I was working. There was only me and maybe one other guy there. And I thought the storm was going to I thought it was going to take the building away. I didn't, I didn't know if it was a tornado or not. It wasn't a tornado, but the, it, was, it was such a strong storm that it damaged our doors in the building we were in. And it, we had a windmill, and it, it threw the windmill in the field uh, behind us, and it did all kinds of things. Now, I've seen a couple tornadoes, but I've never been in one. And that's the kind of storms they have in the Midwest. Now, these cattle drives would happen during the summer when they had tornadoes and they had those severe uh, uh, rainstorms. And uh, if you've been in Kansas, there's, when people drive in Kansas, they say, there's nothing there. Well, that's not true. There's, there's like grass and there's hills, right? But there's no trees. And you can see for miles. Imagine being out in the middle of that uh, grass uh, area in Kansas or Oklahoma or Texas and a storm comes up. Now, you could go under a tree but you'd probably get hit by lightning but there's not any trees. So you're looking for maybe a washed out place underneath neath a creek but maybe you're not in a creek and it just pours on you and it gets cold. The storms you know, on the cattle trail. And it seems like sometimes that the storms always come all together. You know, you see it, you know. You go along life, you're doing pretty good, and then all of a sudden there's several storms right in a row, and, and you're just knocked for a loop, and you're just hunkering down, and you're trying to get through it. And it doesn't do any good to just lay down and give up and die, right? You got to get through it somehow. So you start to pray. And I believe that if the cowboys weren't Christians, if they had any exposure to Christ at all, I'm sure the, the cattle trail would be a good place to witness for Jesus because when you're out there, sometimes you're out there alone and there's nothing around, no help, and you're just by yourself. And maybe you have some other cowboys with you to help you. I think cowboys needed to do a lot of praying. Maybe sometimes they didn't. But we need to do a lot of praying sometimes. And we need to help each other through those storms. You know, the Sea of Galilee was like that too. A storm could come up suddenly. I love this story from Mark, chapter 5, verses 35 through 41. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to it. Mark, chapter 5, verses 35 through 41. If you don't have your Bible, just listen. It's, it's a nice story. I'm going to read it to you. Mark chapter 5, verses 35 through 41. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up and the waves broke, broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Sometimes when the storms come up, we think God's sleeping, don't we? Where are you? I just lost my job. I just found out I have cancer. I, I have heart disease. I fell and broke my hip and, and I'm not doing too well. I saw Ernie, and that's what happened to him. Ernie Wallace, uh, Ernie and Terry have come to our church a few times. My wife or my husband just asked me for a divorce. My child rebelled, took off. I don't know where they're at. My child just died. My spouse died. 
God is our shelter in the storms of life. But sometimes, you know, like the disciples, we wonder if he's asleep. He doesn't respond as quickly as we would like. And so we pray. We say, God, are you up there? What are you doing? Jesus woke up and he, he addressed the storms and he said, Peace, be still. And it was quiet and they were amazed. And so we say, Jesus, I need you. And there are times when in the middle of the storm, you hear that voice of God and you feel that peace and you feel Jesus saying, Peace, be still. And other people look at you and they say, how can you be like this in the middle of this thing you're going through? It's because of Him. He brings the peace that is beyond anything we can understand. But He doesn't promise that the storms won't come up. He's our shelter. We trust in Him. But sometimes we go through storms. Lesson six, it takes more than one cowboy to get the cattle to the end of the trail. Can you imagine a head uh, cowboy, the trail, uh, the, the trail boss, trying to drive a herd of cattle from Kansas three months up to Texas all by himself? All the cowboys kind of had different specialties. You know, some were really good ropers. Some were good trackers. They could track a stray cow. Some were good with a gun. And there was a cook. And then there were the guides who, who remembered the trail and could lead them along the trail. And you know, everyone at some point or another needs another cowboy. They need somebody else. They need encouragement. We can't do it alone. In the Bible, in the 12th chapter of Romans, and the 12th through the 14th chapters of Corinthians, and the 4th chapter of Ephesians, it talks about the body of Christ, that we all have different gifts, different parts working together, helping us to grow up, helping us to get beyond the tenderfoot stage and become trail hands. We need each other. You know, our slogan for this year is building healthy families. And uh, that's why we got the banner up there this week. And that doesn't just mean your own, what we call a nuclear family, your mom and your dad and your brothers and sisters. It means to build an extended family, a church family, because we need each other. We need to encourage one another. And that's our slogan for this year. We want to build healthy families. It is really needed. People are alone. They need others. There are families that are desperate, that are breaking apart. Our mission, our vision this year, our slogan is, we want to build healthy families. And part of what we're doing today is to provide a fun opportunity for families to get together and for people to get to know one another and to just encourage one another. That's one of the reasons we're doing this today, to build, help us build healthy families. I like what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. He says, finally, or no, that's not the love chapter, that's 1 Corinthians 13. In 2 Corinthians 13, 11, he says, finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace, and the God of love will be with you. I like that one part. It, it says edify, but it, it uses the word encourage one another. Build one another up. Live in peace and build one another up. You know, it's a whole lot easier to, to go along this trail of life when we're getting along than it is when the cowboys are all fighting with one another, isn't it? So when the cowboys are laughing and having fun and singing and, and, and helping each other and using their gifts together, it's a wonderful thing. And you know that the cattle are going to be more likely to end, to end up at the end of the trail healthy. And uh, we need one another. We need to encourage one another. So pay attention to what's going on with the people that you know in your church and at work and different places. And if you see someone who looks like they might need some encouragement, maybe there's a strain on their face or they look a little down, say, how's it going? 
I think you're a wonderful person. I enjoy working with you or I enjoy being with you. Is there anything that you need encouragement for or need prayer about? I'd be happy to pray for you. Encourage one another. Live at peace with one another. Help each other. And the God of love and peace will be with you. And then finally, I want to remind us that it will be worth it at the end of the trail. I'm sure when those cowboys had experienced their third uh, thunderstorm in three days, they were wondering if they're ever going to make it to the end of the trail. And they're thinking, yeah, I'm going to get paid for this. But I don't get my pay till the end of the trail. And I'm not sure I'm getting enough. <laughs> or I'm going to make it. But that's how it is in the Christian life. We don't really get our pay till the end of the trail. In the book of Hebrews chapter 11, it talks a whole list of incredible heroes of the faith. And then it says... A lot of them didn't see their pay until after they died. It is possible to live a life, a very difficult life, and not get paid till the end of the trail. And I'm not talking about eternal pay. Eternal life is a pay of itself. But I think about the Apostle Paul. You know, he had it really good. He was uh, one of the brightest students, up-and-coming uh, going to be a new leader someday in the Jerusalem area. He was schooled under Gamaliel. And if you read uh, Hebrew history, you find that there were two main schools of rabbis in the history of, Il of Israel, the school of Hillel and the school of Gamaliel. So he was a number one student of one of the top rabbis, top leaders of all of the history of Israel. And he was doing his job persecuting Christians, dragging them into the courts, and even presided over the stoning, the killing of the, one of the first, the second Christian martyr. The first Christian martyr, of course, was Jesus. Timothy presided over the stoning, but he couldn't get his hands dirty, or Stephen, I should say, couldn't get his hands dirty. So he just held the coats of the ones who were doing the stoning, because he was the boss. And on his way to Damascus, he was struck down and Jesus said, Why are you persecuting me? You see, when we go through difficult times, Jesus identifies with us. And when people, and when we suffer for Christ, Christ himself suffers with us. That's what Paul meant later when he said, uh, I participate in the sufferings of Christ. We participate in the sufferings of Christ. Christ participates and is with us in our sufferings. He's not holding the coat when you're going through a difficult time. That's why he died on the cross. Well, the Apostle Paul had a really good, and then he was struck down and his whole life was changed, and he committed himself, instead of torturing and killing and dragging Christians into jail, he became the Christian. He became the one who spread the faith, and he was a missionary all around the world. And one, in one place he's talking about it, he says, I've been beaten several times, I've been whipped, I've been left for dead and stoned more than once. He wasn't talking about alcohol either. He said, I've been through all this stuff. And what he was talking about is there are people in the church he was writing to that didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. He says, you think I'd be doing this if I didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead? <laughs> I'd be nuts. <laughs> Look at my life. Look at my scars. But he was talking about the end of the trail. There is a reward. There is a payment at the end of the trail. You know what the payment is? It's not going to be gold crowns because... You and I are going to be so overwhelmed with the presence of God, we're going to throw our crowns, our rewards at the feet of Jesus. It's going to be the very presence of God himself. That's the reward at the end of the trail. The presence of God. Being with God. We see only a, through a, dark gla uh, a, a, a glass darkly right now. We get a little flicker of the light of God in us through the Holy Spirit. But in heaven, we're going to be surrounded by the light of God and we're going to be fed from the stream of God, which never ends. And the metaphors in Scripture are so incredible, but they can't even begin to explain what the end of the trail is going to be like. 
I would imagine the cowboys enjoyed a hot bath and they enjoyed a good steak at the end of the trail. But that is nothing compared to the feast that we're going to have in heaven, to the feeling of being in the warm, warm, warmth and glow of the, our Heavenly Father. It is worth it at the end of the trail. And here's what the Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 3. He said, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. All that stuff that he had with the temple and Jerusalem and his status, all that stuff. I, I have lost all things. I consider them garbage. That I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. <laughs> yes, to know the power of resurrection and participation in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And what is that prize? That prize is Jesus Himself. That's what He was seeking. It's going to be worth it when we get to the end of the trail. Praise God. Amen. Keep your eyes on the trail. No matter what comes in life, keep on the trail and let's encourage and work with one another. We have a song we're going to sing as we close the service today. And there will be a few minutes to greet one another, say hi to one another, and then we'll be eating at 11 o'clock. So stick around. And at 11 o'clock, we can line up and start eating. Those that are helping with the, uh, with the Western days, with the kids, you guys can go right away and eat, and eat first, and the rest of us will, will eat later. So let's stand as we sing and, and praise the Lord through His songs. If you want to come and kneel at the altar and have a time of prayer while we're singing, please feel free to do that. God bless you. Just
precious blood he shed for me his life he gave i need no other argument i need no other plea it is enough that jesus died pray, please take whatever posture will best help you remember that God is here and we are speaking with him. Dear Lord, we thank you for the lessons for life that you've left us in your word. We thank you for being willing to live through a life here on this earth just like we do. And to have to deal with some of the hardships that we deal with. And in the end, to die on the cross a human death. And not just to experience that death, but be, to be willing to take the consequence for the choices we've made that are wrong and that are against the will of God. Thank you so much, Lord, for the gift you gave us that day. Thank you so much that after toiling through the trail of this life, that it's worth it at the end. And Lord, I know many of us have experienced already in our lives walking with you that it's worth it even now. Thank you, Lord, for the joy and the peace inside of us when life is going crazy, if we have you to lean on, if we have your strength within us, oh Lord, you offer us such blessings. Lord, I pray that this morning you'll help each of us to lay down the heavy burdens that we carry of worry and of fear I pray that you'll help us to trust you with everything, with our health and with our families and with our jobs or our lack of jobs and with our finances. Lord, help us to trust you completely. Guide us as we make decisions about these things in life and direct us every day along this trail. Show us where to go what to do, how to live. We need your spirit inside of us to direct us. And we will give you all the glory as life goes on and you bring us through challenge after challenge with peace and with joy. We will give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.